Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the third QTech 360 seminar, but it's the first one uh, where it's a pitch winner that gives a presentation. And it's uh, no one less than Patrick Harvey Kalar. Uh, he did his PhD thesis in Sandia National Laboratory in 2013 and then graduated in 2018. After that, came to QTech, where he joined the group of Lieven van der Seypen. And, and what I think, what, what, if I think of Patrick, what really strikes me is that he has an opinion and really thoughts about basically everything. This can be about fabrication, measurements, analysis, perhaps even the, the meetings that we do and so forth. And I think that that's really fantastic to see such a broad mind. Um, Patrick has a long history in, in semiconductor qubits. And I think the one aspect that, that he really did do was to solve and make a big step forward in, in readout. I think this was always a topic that not so many people like to think about. This was a hard topic, but he really showed uh, work where um, or readout is of high fidelity um, and, and very fast. And after that, in, in, in the group of Lieben van der Seypen, he again went to a very important topic, and that's understanding and, and we are studying uh, how to couple spin qubits on a distance. And then that's where he will talk about today. Uh, the title of the talk is Circuit Quantum Electrodynamics with Two Remote Electron Spins. And with that, I want to give you the floor to you, Patrick. All right. Thanks a lot, Menno. I appreciate the introduction. Welcome, everyone. My name is Patrick. I'm a postdoc in um, Lieven van der Seypen's group. And um, yeah, today I want to tell you about um, this line of research in Lieven's group um, about circuit quantum electrodynamics with spin qubits in, in silicon. So during the presentation, please feel free to interrupt at any time and ask questions um, by simply unmuting yourself and um, inter interrupting the presentation. So um, let's jump into it. So before uh, I talk about all this work, let me mention some very important contributions from um, the team members that have worked uh, on this project over the years and especially uh, Jochen Dijkma here and Gu Zheng, who are uh, uh, current and former PhD students in the group uh, that have contributed a lot to the electrical measurements that I'm gonna show. Um, then we have Tobias Bonson um, and Max Russ, who uh, Tobias is a master student who has done a lot of modeling uh, input output theory as a master project with me. Um, and uh, this was done under the supervision of uh, Lieven van der Seypen, of course and the great materials, silicon germanium heterostructures that we work on provided by um, the group of Gio, Giordano Scapucci with the assistant from, uh, from Amir. So uh, let me start by motivating why uh, we are interested in circuit quantum electrodynamics with spin qubits. So we would like to basically uh, combine the advantages of uh, different qubit platforms, namely, it seems like circuit QED uh, with superconducting qubits, um, they can tap into these cavity couplers that enable chip scale interaction of qubits. And also they have this uh, nice dispersive readout that allows uh, multiplet fixing uh, using the resonators. And it's quite high speed. Uh, on the other hand, you have spin qubits, which have um, quite, long, quite high fidelity and long, long T2 stars and, and also long T1s. Uh, most importantly. So it would be great to combine these two. And um, when you try to combine the two, you also come up with a platform that has its own features, like the coupling between spin qubits and resonator photons is naturally tunable, which is a feature that's very hard to achieve with superconducting qubits. Um, and the resonators I'm gonna show are, are very scaled down compared to traditional CQED devices, which can be also an advantage. And um, finally, a lot of the techniques that uh, we're developing for this work, I think apply very nicely to Majorana fermion devices and other type of uh, hybrid superconducting and semiconducting devices that are investigated in, um, in like the topo groups and whatnot here at QTech. So this is the device I'm gonna use for uh, all the experiments I'm gonna present in this uh, seminar. Um, it's made of a, here in the clean room uh, at Kavli. And um, the 
most of the surface is covered with uh, niobium titanium nitride. And it's made very thin in such a way that it has a very large sheet inductance. Uh, in this case, we target it to be around 115 pico enries per square. Um, and this is so that we can carve a, a nanowire resonator out of this niobium titanium nitride superconductor with very large kinetic inductance, um, which produces a resonator that has a high impedance and also uh, a very uh, short dimension. Now, this resonator here is, is 250 microns in length, and you can already see that this is quite a bit shorter than your typical 50 ohm circuit QED resonator. And this is for a traditional, you know, seven gigahertz frequency, resonance frequency. So at the end of this superconducting resonator, um, of course, we have, you know, microwave ports to couple into the resonator, but we most importantly have these spin qubit gate electrode structures here. Um, that terminate here where this uh, resonator is also. Uh, and this will allow us to form quantum dots at each end of this uh, resonator. So here is a microscope image, electron microscope image of the gate structure here. You can see these are aluminum gates uh, and the quantum dots will form underneath these little paddle gates here. And uh, moreover, on top of the structure, we have these cobalt micromagnets that will induce a very uh, large artificial spin orbit interaction so that we can couple ultimately our spins to uh, our photons. So I'm gonna explain how this works uh, later. Um, so the semiconductor structure is um, isotopically enriched silicon 28 uh, in a silicon quantum, uh, in a SIGI uh, quantum well uh, heterostructure basically. Um, so if there's no, um, you guys can already start asking questions, by the way. Um, so one of the, the key challenges we had to solve early on is that um, the first structures we made in, in the group were these kind of like uh, dipolar mode resonators, or basically like um, this resonator had this, um, this floppy mode at the end, which does not emit microwaves into the gate, gate fan out lounge. And when we tried to couple spins at the distance, we basically unfolded the resonator and starting having a, started having a lot of, of, of microwave losses through the gate structures. This is a known issue in the field and people have tackled this many different ways over the years, but basically we were, we were kind of lucky initially and didn't realize that uh, we were having this protection from this structure until we lost it. So we basically turned to a solution that looks more like gate filters. And the idea is that you will put LC filters on your gate structures to prevent leakage. So what happens here is that we have this resonator with the lambda two mode and the capacitance between your resonator and your, your, your gate electrodes that you use to confine your quantum dots, it can act as a, as a uncontrolled microwave port, if you will, and you can leak your microwaves um, into these, these gate fan out lines, just like you will in your, in your coupling ports. And that can be a quite large contribution um, for losses in your resonators when you try to integrate them with quantum dots. And it's particularly bad in our case because we engineer the impedance to be super high, which means we want high inductance and small capacitance. So if you have a small capacitance, that means that um, you know the, the gate structures are, they're not, they don't shrink. So, uh, they just become a larger fraction of the total capacitance of the device. That makes your losses really bad. So the solution we came up with uh, is to use nanowire inductors that are carved out of the same film as the resonator itself. Um, that's that's going to provide the, the inductor for our LC filters. Then we made this thin film capacitor here that overlaps our gate lines. And um, then you have an LC filter that basically provides an, an AC ground to your resonator. So basically it, to the resonator it, at that seven gigahertz frequency, it looks as though the gates are part of the ground plane basically. And that, that's, the, that's the intent. So to test this, we made some mock-up devices that had the similar uh, capacitance and, and microwave hygiene. And we were able to show that um, we can preserve now the quality factors of these structures quite nicely um, using the scheme. So then that allows you to bring in a lot more gates and, and make very complicated quantum dot structures next to your resonator. 
Um, next, I'm going to move to the topic of using the resonators to um, sense your quantum dots. And so this is kind of a semi-classical thing, basically, where that's going to transition over to the, the circuit QED regime. But basically, traditionally, if you look at spin qubits, people have been using single electron transistors and or um, quantum point contacts to do charge sensing. And the idea here is that you put this charge sensor quite close to your quantum dots. And by capacitive interaction, when you move charge around on your quantum dots, um, it will shift the Coulomb blockade of your, your single electron transistor, produce a change in the current, and then you can detect this. Um, now, this requires a lot of footprint um, in, a, in a global architecture if you start to, to put more and more dots together. So the neat thing with gate, gate sensing um, is that you can basically detect the electron tunneling between the quantum dots without uh, needing any kind of like external charge sensor that's capacitively coupled to your quantum dot structure. So that's quite nice. Um, and it's a very old technique uh, that was used with off-chip resonators before, but uh, recently it got made um, a lot better thanks to the on-chip resonators because you can reduce the capa uh, parasitic capacitance uh, in this way. And if you engineer everything right, you can have very large coupling of your, your resonator to your double quantum dot structures. And recently we shown that um, this can translate into a, spin to charge conversion fidelity and readout of in excess of 98% in six microseconds. And there's actually other groups at QTech now that, um, that use uh, resonator technologies to do readout of semiconductor structures in the, in the topo group. There's actually this really nice work uh, down here that I'm, I'm citing here. So um, it's becoming an increasingly popular approach to measure quantum dots and, um, yeah, and the, the way we engineer the resonators for the cavity QED experiments has really enabled like a, a next level of sensitivity for this kind of dispersive resonator-based charge sensing. Um, this is a charge stability diagram of a double quantum dot that we um, acquire using this resonator. And I'm gonna describe the physics here of, of how this works briefly. The idea is that you know, your resonance frequency is um, you know, one over square root LC. And um, there's two main contributions to the signal when you use the resonator in this way. The first one is some kind of coherent uh, quantum capacitance effect, where basically the electron tunneling between the dots will effectively load the resonator and, and shift its resonance frequency like, the, like this. And the other effect that um, might contribute to the signal is also just dissipation, where you will broaden the resonator and therefore uh, see a change in, in signal. So uh, in general, you have some kind of combination of these two effects that will give you uh, the signal depending on, on the details of the system you're probing. And so these, um, the signal, what you do here is you, we, we park the resonator on resonance. And whenever we hit the charge transition, we see the edges of the charge stability regions uh, in the charge stability diagram. Um, so one good example of this that transitions nicely into the quantum regime of this, this uh, gate-based sensing is the following. So if you look at this interdot charge transition here, um, what you see is that um, we can probe the resonator transmission. And when we hit zero detuning, we very nicely see that the, the, the resonator frequency is pulled down by this capacitive interaction and then, and then goes back up. And this you can view in a Jane Scumming kind of picture where you have your charge qubit way up there and you have your, your resonator photons and uh, the dispersive interaction between the two will uh, kind of like shift each other. And with this, you can, you can figure out how much coupling you have. And in our case, we end up with about 200 megahertz of, of charge, charge photon coupling, uh, which is very good because then that means that uh, you can shift your, your resonance frequency by way more than the line width and get a large amount of signal uh, from this, which is the key to do readout in the end. Um, so unless there's like more questions, I'm gonna transition over to spin photon coupling and the, the really CQED aspects of, of this. So um, now the, the main goal of these experiments is to couple spins to, um, 
to photons. And this has been achieved now by uh, many groups, including uh, our group here at TU Delft. And here, you, what you see is that um, it's a vacuum Rabi splitting measurement, basically. Um, so the spin energy is um, swept through the resonator energy. And when they cross each other, you see an avoided crossing. And this is the hallmark of, of uh, the start of CQED experiment where um, you reach a strong coupling regime. This has been achieved by many groups, including ours, um, and uh, some, a group at Sprinton, Princeton that has demonstrated that you can do resonant uh, spin to photon to spin uh, coupling, basically. And also um, nice experiments at ETH Zurich when, where they have demonstrated interaction between uh, charge qubits and also between like uh, spin and spin qubits and, and transmons, hybrid kind of qubits. Um, so this is very interesting, but there's a, a very important missing experiment in there, which is to actually couple two spin qubits directly through the resonator, um, but via virtual um, resonator photons, which is the real regime that uh, you want to be in for most uh, circuit QED experiments that um, people, people do today. And the reason it hasn't been done before is because you require a larger uh, co uh, interaction strength to decoherence ratio that was previously achieved um, combined with fabrication difficulties. Uh, so in this work, we will we basically overcome these challenges and demonstrate spin-spin interaction in the dispersive uh, regime of circuit QED through the, the resonator. So the physics of how this works is the following, and this is a, a quite important um, concept slide. Um, so the way the spin do, the, does not directly couple to photons um, very well because the magnetic moment uh, and the mag uh, is very small and the magnetic field from the photons of the resonator is also very small. So the direct interaction is like a few Hertz, which is not sufficient to go anywhere. So what we do instead is we will use this virtual transition through the charge, so-called charge qubit. And this will allow us to mediate the coupling uh, to the cavity photon. So basically using this micromagnet on the device, uh, we, will, we will couple the spin degree of freedom to the charge degree of freedom. And then we will couple the charge degree of freedom to, um, to the resonator photons. So the spin qubit energy is just a Zeeman energy. Um, and the charge qubit energy um, is determined by this uh, 2TC, the tunnel, which is the tunnel coupling between the two quantum dots. And the eigenstates of the charge is the symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations of uh, superpositions of the left and right quantum dot states. Um, so this artificial my, uh, spin orbit interaction couples the spin to the charge. And then to couple the charge to the cavity photons, um, you first need um, some zero point fluctuations from your photons. And that's where the high impedance resonator kicks in because your zero point photon fluctuations are proportional to the square root of the impedance of this resonator. And finally, you also scale that by uh, the, the quantum dot gate lever arm. Uh, basically your resonator will try to plunge your charge qubit, which will ultimately induce a coupling between the charge and the photons. Um, so that's that's how it works, and then you end up with with an effective coupling between your spin qubits and your your cavity photons, and you can you can basically tune the amount of spin orbit interaction that you have by tuning this tunnel coupling, and also if you if you detune your quantum dot and you don't sit at this zero detuning point here, um, then you basically have zero interaction with the cavity photons um, because you just don't have this this um, charge qubit hybridization between the left and the right quantum dot states. And so in the dispersive picture, it looks a bit like this, where um, you have your resonator photons and your spin qubits. And when you, when you uh, isolate your electrons in one dot, and when you delocalize the electron at zero charge detuning, then all of these frequencies will move because of various um, interactions. So first of all, your uh, this is the the dispersive shift uh, due to the charge qubit here. And then this guy, the spin transition will move down because of spin orbit interaction. And then it will all further split because of spin photon interactions. So we will go uh, further uh, into details later about how this works. Um, 
for the people out there that are a bit more, let's say, Hamiltonian uh, orient oriented, this is the Hamiltonian we use to model the system. It's got your resonator photons here, uh, and this is your double quantum dot Hamiltonian. Um, so you have the charge degree of freedom with the tau, you have the spin degree of freedom with the sigma, and finally you have this coupling of the charge degree of freedom to your cavity field uh, like this with the coupling constant you see. Um, for people that are interested in those details. So first of all, um, I will walk you through this experiment where we demonstrate uh, strong spin photon coupling for each quantum dot. Um, so the first thing that you can do is you can probe the transmission of the resonator uh, as a function of the external magnetic field and the external magnetic field would change the Zeeman energy of the spin transition. And when the spin transition cuts through the resonator transition, you see this nice avoided crossing that forms. And this is your vacuum Rabi splitting. The next thing you can also do in this experiment is use the resonator to sense the spin dispersively, um, just like you would a transmon. And um, what you do is you, you now send a pump tone to generate an excited state spin population, and you will probe the resonator transmission here at this frequency, and you will get the signal whenever you flip the, the spin qubit. Um, and then you can extract the different coupling strengths and line widths and figure out that indeed we are in the strong coupling regime for both dots. So hopefully this is all clear so far. Um, now we will use our um, the external magnetic field angle and tune it to this specific value here to make sure that the two spins have exactly the same Zeeman energy at the same time as they cross the resonator to see some, some coherent spin-spin photon interaction. Um, so this is, again, the vacuum Rabi splitting measurement of the first double quantum dot when it's interacting with the resonator by itself. And on the right here, you also have the similar measurement for the other double quantum dot. So we see two vacuum Rabi splittings. And the strength of this, uh, this 2G is about 23 megahertz. And now what happens is when we allow both quantum dots to interact simultaneously with the resonator, uh, you first see more sh dispersive shift from the interaction with the charge and you see an enhanced vacuum Rabi splitting by a factor square root two. And this is because of the collective uh, announcement from uh, the two spins that interact with the resonator simultaneously. Um, so this is, very, uh, this is a very nice first step. This is what has been demonstrated by the Princeton group before. Now, this coupling constant here is too small to do the experiments in the dispersive uh, regime. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase this by changing our tunnel coupling, make that a lot larger. Um, and now I'm going to present, walk you through this experiment here, where um, we will see what happens if we put the two spins in resonance and out of, uh, of resonance with each other. So now we, we sit here where the spin qubit is below the resonator frequency, and we're only going to have virtual transitions through the resonator. And when you hit the, you, you change the detuning of the quantum dot, you, you see a resonator signal appear. Um, and that's, um, that's okay. That's your, start, your, your dispersive shift from the charge. And then you start to send the spin and the spin transition is going down like this because of the spin orbit hybridization that happens at zero detuning. That's this shift right here. Um, and then you can see that there's a faint line here and that's the spin uh, transition uh, that we excite with our pump signal. And then we probe at this, this frequency here, the resonator, and we're dispersively uh, basically doing a two-tone experiment, sensing our spin tra transitions. And now when we allow both spins uh, to interact simultaneously with the resonator, we see that the two spins here are at different frequencies and they, they barely affect each other. We don't really see any sign of, of interaction between the two. However, when we turn the external magnetic field in such a way that uh, both spins have the same, same transition frequency, what we see now is when we allow both spins to interact together, uh, we see that this spin is kind of like pushing down the other spin 
when the inter when the interaction is turned on. And this is the effect that we're after basically. Um, and this is our um, effective exchange coupling that's mediated by resonator photons. So this is very nice. Now, the, the thing that we're gonna do next, we're, we're gonna try to map out how, how this evolves as a function of the external magnetic field angle, or if you will, the or each spin transition frequency. So what we do is we can we can take lines along diagrams like I just showed before, and we can change the external magnetic field angle. And what you see here is that we are changing the, the spin frequency of double quantum dot one and double quantum dot two. And again, in this two-tone experiment, we're just sensing the span with the with the resonator. And this energy changes because we change the external magnetic field angle and therefore we become more aligned with one of the two micromagnet axes and one of them is getting reinforced and that allows them to be like very precisely um, at the same frequency. And now when, when we allow both spins to interact simultaneously, uh, we see this nice avoided crossing here between the spin, uh, between the two spin states now in the dispersive regime. So the size of this avoided crossing is 2j, and this is your, your virtual um, exchange between uh, the two spins. Um, now here you can see that the, the coupling constant uh, for the spin to the photon is quite a bit larger than the experiment it was before. Before it was, um, it was uh, around uh, uh, 12 uh, megahertz and now it's 35. So the other remarkable feature that we see here is the appearance of this dark state here, which I'm gonna um, explain a little bit later, more about later. So the next thing that we do is we can investigate how this spin-spin uh, uh, interaction changes as a function of spin photon detuning. So we're gonna basically step the external magnetic field from 52 to 51 to 50, Milli Tesla that's gonna reduce our spin transition energy, make the detuning larger. And since, since this is a perturbative effect, um, the size of the exchange interaction should go down as we increase this detuning. This is indeed what we see, um, that the transition frequencies get lower and that the size of this avoided crossing is shrinking as we increase uh, the absolute value of this detuning. And we summarize this nicely in this plot by plotting the exchange interaction here against the external magnetic field or spin photon detuning. Um, and we have pretty good agreement between our, our model theory, uh, which is exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian I showed before, and um, the angular dependence of these, uh, these transition frequencies. All right. So um, let's transition over to a different set of experiments, which is now about um, resolving single microwave photons using the spin qubit. This is another very important um, cavity QED experiment. And um, it's basically uh, related to the one before because it's also an effect that depends um, on upon like G squared over, over delta. So the idea here is that if we crank up the, the resonator probe power a, li a little bit, we start to see this extra transition appear here um, next to the, the ground state spin transition. And we identify these transitions as um, spin flips when there is one photon present in the resonator. Uh, so basically what's happening is that the spin qubit frequency depends on uh, the number of photons in the resonator. And this is actually just a reverse effect of, of, um, of dispersive spin sensing because basically the way we, we measure the signal is that um, the resonator frequency will get, will get shifted based on the spin state of the spin. And, and this splitting is two chi. And what we see here uh, with the spin transition frequency is the converse of this where uh, conditional on the number of photons you have in the resonator, your spin transition frequency will shift by two chi. And then we can, we can fit the distribution of these peaks um, to uh, a very simple model and figure out the splitting between these peaks. Um, 
and the amplitude distribution of them. The expectation being that um, the, the area under each peak should uh, be proportional to the photon, the probability of each photon number. And you can map that out for like thermal and coherent state distributions and plot this versus the, the photon number peak here. And what we see is that um, the distribution agrees better with the coherent state distribution than a thermal distribution. And the reason is quite simple is because we are, we are sending some probe photons to probe the, resin, the spin qubit state while we're doing this experiment. So we do have a finite photon population in the resonator, uh, which means that uh, we're measuring this, we're seeing this coherent state distribution. Uh, so this is, um, this is very exciting as well, because this also, uh, a first for spin qubits, and it's exciting also because it requires a larger amount, a large amount of coherence in the system, uh, both narrow line widths for the resonator and the spin qubits compared to the to the couplings to be able to resolve these individual photons number states in the resonator, and this has been achieved in circuit QED before with with superconducting qubits. So next, I'm going to move to um, some input-output theory modeling of this system. But does anyone has questions so far? I see that everyone's a bit shy to ask questions. Let me ask actually uh, one, Patrick. So well, I think we're just all quiet because of these beautiful uh, results. Um, I was more looking into a next step. So uh, I think it's very creative and clever, all these field angles. Um, have you already thought how you would go to three or four? Let's say if you, how do you do this in larger systems? Do you want to create some current for lines to generate fields or how would you do that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the micromagnet scheme with um, the little angles like this is um, not very scalable, right? So it works well for two, um, but it's hard to imagine it will work very well, even just for three. So um, then the question is, how, how would you do it? Um, one of the most obvious answers is to use um, triple dot spin qubits, which are called uh, all exchange qubits to do this coupling. In an all exchange qubit, basically you have uh, the, the energy of your qubit is uh, tunable via the exchange and uh, the tunnel couplings of each dot. Uh, and ultimately the exchange interaction between all the, the three spins. So there, therefore, um, you can basically electrically tune the energy of your spin qubit uh, to make it resonant with, with each other or, or, or be at whatever frequency you would like, like it to be, which is kind of nice. Uh, and this is a scheme that other labs are, are pursuing, I believe, including the Princeton group. They don't have results yet on this, but I know they're working on this approach and there's also theory proposals on this. Um, another possibility is to use spin orbit interaction in a large spin orbit interaction material to engineer um, this coupling. And then the, the hope would be that you can voltage tune your, your, your spin qubit transition um, enough that you can make them uh, be at, at the required frequencies given the certain magnetic field angle that you have. Um, and this, it remains to be seen like what's the range of tunability that you have, but in principle it's tunable and you could probably engineer to, to make this happen at least for a few. These are two possible uh, route forwards. Yeah, so lastly, I will mention this uh, nice work that uh, we, uh, we are, are currently wrapping up with master student uh, Tobias Bonson and also in collaboration with Max, is about uh, generalized input output theory um, in this system. So when we were trying to understand some of the more complicated features in this experiment, we realized that the, the prevailing input output theories in our field uh, did not capture what we see we were seeing in the experiments. And one of these features is this, um, this little transition here. So this is a vacuum Rabi splitting experiment. And you can see that there's there seems to be a transition here that's going up, 
Uh, and the theory just simply doesn't have this. And no matter how we we spin, we kind of like flip things around, we couldn't see that feature. Um, and uh, after plotting some transitions and doing some 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 research around, we came up with um, the solution to use the SLH input output framework to model the system. So basically, um, it's a known framework in 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 op quantum optics where you uh, basically you it's a framework to cascade cavities and quantum systems into each other. So here you have you have a cavity, then you have input and output fields. You have some thermal um, excitation here. You have your coupling to another quantum system. Again, some 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 decay channel and these kinds of things. And you can just cascade them into each other. And provided you have enough computational power, you can you can crush the problem and kind of pull out these plots. Um, so the guys did did some math to make that solvable, and then uh, came up with these nice simulations where um, we now see this excited state, which is caused by excited um, Photon number transitions in the James Cummings ladder. Yes, I see a question. Question from from Christian. Yes, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I just had a question uh, to to this uh, sort of SLH here. Uh, so my understanding of it is SLH, but maybe you can correct me. But was that this is essentially just let's say rules of calculation for how to let's say deal with the standard input output theory, right? There's nothing new physics in the SLH format. It's, it's more like a, a framework to keep track of all the channels. So I guess when you say that there were some features not captured in the standard input output theory, I guess it was because you were already then sort of intrinsically neglecting some terms or- Exactly, do I understand that exactly. Correctly? So, so um, it, it, it's an important precision for the experts. It's not that it's not a failure of input-output theory itself. It's it's more uh, the treatment that people have done in our specific field of trying to apply input-output theory to hybrid spin photon systems. They're simplifying the problem to make it uh, more analytically solvable, and in doing so, they remove the entanglement between the quantum dot and the resonator which in the end can turn out to be quite important for, for a lot of effects. Uh, so basically like they, they, they basically just had oversimplified the, the problem and left out some important physics. Uh, so indeed it's not, um, it, it's the treatment that people had done like in, in our field applying, applying it to this specific problem and not, not the general failure of the thing. Um, and yes, indeed, when you apply it correctly without neglecting these terms, now you recover all the features. Uh, so it, it's not, we, we didn't come up with, with this um, uh, SLH stuff, of course, it's a well-known framework in, in the field, um, but it's just people before are just not, not dragged, in, uh, dragged that, that heavy artillery into, the, into the, the field yet. And that's not entirely true. I mean, uh, the ETH group had been doing this uh, um, in, their, in their experiments to, to explain some of the results uh, as I, as I uh, mentioned down there very subtly. Um, so, yeah. Okay, great. Then I think that, that that's clear. Then. Thanks. Um, so then we were, uh, so these excited state features had been attributed to like, uh, people were suspecting they were like, you know, excited valley states or, or, or other kinds of weird things that happen with the charge degree of freedom. And, um, and it was nice to basically like just find the explanation for these. And in this case, uh, if you look at the James, James Cummings ladder, it's basically transitions between excited states in the system that create this lobe-sided feature around, um, around the, the vacuum Robbie splitting. So it looks a bit different, but in, it's seen in, in, in transmits before and, and uh, but people have realized like how shapes like translating into the spin, the shapes are not this. Um, so what we do here in, in series is we, we can first use a very robe and measure the vacuum rubbies. And we see that the transitions here remain, remain um, quite sharp. Uh, everyone's still hearing me okay? Yeah, okay. So, 
uh, these transitions here remain quite sharp. And now if we crank up the probe power of, uh, of our experiment, we can see several effects. We're quenching the vacuum Robbie splitting because we no longer have a vacuum. And we start to see these lobe-sided transitions here um, that I identified there. And you can also see now this, this fan-like structure here. These are transitions, uh, basically multi-photon transitions, uh, which look more like this in the James Cummings ladder. And that's more like in this, uh, what's been demonstrated in this paper. So to see this feature, basically you need enough coherence again to, to be able to resolve them within the line width of the, of the spin transition. So this input output framework works pretty nicely to explain what we see in the spin photon experiments. And the last um, kind of modeling that um, Tobias has gotten into recently is to try to um, generalize this to two-tone spectroscopy. To, and then he's able to um, see that in the spin-spin experiment here, we can model the, the, the dark state of the spin-spin coupling quite, uh, quite nicely. Um, so that covers basically everything I had to tell you guys about for today. So in summary, um, we have implemented this um, circuit QED platform with spin qubits in Levin's group, uh, where we make very high impedance resonator devices with large, large coupling to double quantum dot charge degree of freedom. Um, and we also um, came up with these very compact gate filters to mitigate microwave losses to um, the gate fan outline so that you can make very complicated dot structures that integrate well with your resonators. And finally, we've used these devices to um, measure two um, uh, experiments in the dispersive regime of circuit QED, uh, namely the spin spin interaction mediated by resonator photons and the photon number dispens dependent dispersive shift. Um, so, with this, if you guys have more questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Patrick, but let's first unmute all ourselves and give Patrick a big applause. Um, let's see if someone wants to ask a question, just unmute yourself or raise your hand and we'll give the floor. It seems we still need to have some warm up. We have some time. Um, Patrick, if I may ask, um, so something I was wondering is where uh, um, where should the next technological advancement be? So for example, you have in these gate filters, you showed that you still have a high Q factor. Um, would it make sense to further optimize that? Or is it now all in the device where the losses are um, or not? Um, do you have ideas on that? Yeah, that's a good question. So. As of now, the, the, the intrinsic losses of the resonator are no longer a limiting factor. So in real devices, we have a bit more losses than in these test devices. And this is because of the, um, the, the junction, we believe it's the junction between the aluminum gates and the, the niobium tinitride that's a bit dissipative, um, but it's still, it's still you know order of megahertz. And, when we do these experiments, the resonator is more like three megahertz. So what's happening actually is the charge qubit has some losses. The charge qubit line width is um, basically like 60 megahertz. Uh, and so when you couple this um, dispersively to the cavity photons, I'm uh, here, uh, you have some Purcell decay of the charge qubit that kind of like couples into your, your, your cavity photons and it basically, uh, starts to affect significantly the the quality factor of the resonator. I'd say that's the that's the biggest limit so far on um, on like the quality factor of the resonator itself when we do these these experiments, and that kind of upper bounds the the GS that we can get uh, for now. So we by basically like the future improvements should all be centered on reducing charge noise in the system because that's the biggest weakness of most spin qubit architectures, but especially this articulate, this this struct, this um, the scheme is is um, is is similar in that respect. So, um, because of this spin orbit interaction that you induce here, you give a charge dipole to your spin qubit. It's still mostly spin like, 
but it it lets in the charge noise and that becomes the dominant source of decoherence for your spin qubit. Um, so you need to mit mitigate that as much as possible. Um, and that will help on both, both aspects. Okay, thanks. Um, any questions from the audience? Can be fab questions too. Hi, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so basically what you did in this research is uh, um, increasing these coupling strengths, but now the coupling strength that you achieved high enough for what you want to do next. And for instance, can you already make entangled states between these different uh, quantum dots? Yeah, that's a good question. So let me um, bring up a different slide here. This one. Um, so these coupling strengths are, um, like I briefly mentioned earlier, kind of limited by how much we can we dare to to make the spin qubit uh, charge like, and mostly because we start to lose the visibility of the the resonator when we we do this. Um, right now, it's 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 high enough to do some two qubit gates. So the next step would be to um, to basically do time domain control of this experiment and try to prepare and read out some, some states and, and then to allow the simultaneous interaction and, and to basically do a two qubit gate mediated by the resonator. Um, so in this spectroscopy experiment, uh, the fact that you see this avoided crossing here means that the two spin states here, they're no longer the the separated eigenstates, but they're actually like hybridized together in like singlets and triplets, basically. So in that sense, they're already untangled uh, through the through the resonator. But the the aspect that's missing is the time domain control to turn that into some kind of quantum operation. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, but then do you also have, do, did you already run some simulations on what kind of fidelities then for two qubit gates you would expect? Yeah, so we, we didn't do detailed studies of this. There's, there's theory papers that look at this out there. Um, we think right now we can probably reach around 90%. And if we want to go beyond this, we will need to reduce charge noise uh, further than what, what we have um, right now. Um, and so to be very honest, like, you know, at the moment, to me personally, this, this is still just fun physics experiments. I think it's kind of cool to be able to count photons with, with the spin, uh, because it's not something that they do very naturally. Um, and it's, it, it, it's not really, uh, it's not ready to market <laughs> as a, as a quantum computing platform yet, but there's nothing that it's been improving quite a bit throughout the years. And so there's nothing that says that it cannot, you know, be useful in the future. Yeah. So I would also add, unless there's like people that want to jump in on this. Um, so there's a lot of improvements that, uh, or, or device technology aspects that we've developed for this project um, that have a lot of applications uh, just for spin qubits. And one good example of this is the readout. So um, although we engineered the resonators to do this, these, these CQED experiments, they turn out to be really good at just reading out the quantum dots. Um, and we're thinking uh, because of this, we want to use them to, to just do charge sensing of, of regular spin qubits without the CQED aspects. Um, and that's because the, yeah, we had to solve some technological problems to, to achieve this that are beneficial for, for readout as well. Great. Um, are there more questions? If not, I think uh, it was a very nice pleasure and, and absolutely fun in exciting physics uh, uh, at the least. And I'm looking very much forward to seeing this, this progress. Uh, let's give all Patrick another round of applause and thank you all for coming to the uh, seminar.